the introduction. You got it. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Drew Stevens, and I have with me a great colleague in Saeed Akbani. Today, we want to talk to you a little bit about protecting and securing your business. The plan here is to have an interactive discussion between Saeed and myself about things that you can do as a business owner or even a senior leader within business to protect and secure your business. We've got some good tools and some good resources to assist you. So to start the conversation going, we want to tell you a little bit about ourselves, who we are, why we're here, and then we're going to get immediately into the program. Let me introduce to you my good friend and colleague, Saeed Akbani. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Drew. I uh, really appreciate the introduction. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to start off by discussing, you know, why we want to uh, discuss this topic with you. Uh, there are two aspects to it. Uh, one is the security side of the business, and the other is, uh, you know, uh, the, the people side and the processes side that that Drew uh, would be talking uh, to you about. So on my side, what I would uh, talk about is is really the, the IT security side. Uh, you can see that 70% of all data breaches impact small and medium-sized organizations. Uh, you can read the rest of the statistics uh, on your own, but suffice it to say, that uh, you know, security breaches cost businesses a lot of money, and uh, it is good investment to in, to invest in 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 IT security, in cybersecurity, to be more exact. Excellent, thank you, Sadie. Net, you know, as we look at businesses today, here's what we're finding, and we want to provide some good data in which for you to protect your business. The role here is to provide you with some very hard facts and figures, as well as provide you with some soft skills to help you protect your particular business, whether you're an employee or you want it yourself. Here's what we're finding today is that 92% of most small or medium-sized enterprises have three and owners or less. And I'll describe exactly why that's imperative, especially as we talk to you today in the midst of the global pandemic that we're under. What we're also seeing is that from the Small Business Administration, as you all know, you probably have done your research, 90% of most businesses fail within two years. There's a dire reason for that. And you need to be attentive to what those reasons are. So if you're trying to start a business, whether it was before the pandemic or during it, the fact is, is we want to give you some tools and techniques that will help you last through that financial gap that exists and to make you better. And last but not least, here's what I find potentially, especially with the uh, programs that I work with, with many of the organizations. And that is, what I find is that businesses are really financially fragile. I find that most businesses would have about $10,000 in monthly expenses, maybe more because I deal with small and medium-sized businesses, but here is why businesses are failing today, and that's because they don't have enough cash on hand. If you have less than two weeks cash on hand, you will fail, and I'll talk a little bit about that within this uh, presentation as we get going. Let me uh, talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Saeed Akbani, uh, founder of Data Dynamics. Uh, I have 30 years of technology consulting experience. I don't know to be proud of the fact or, or to be ashamed that I'm too old. Uh, but anyway, it is uh, what it is. It's 30 years of uh, technology consulting experience. I have uh, a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Washington University, a master's in electrical engineering from University of Michigan, and uh, an MBA from Olin Business School, Washington University, which I obtained in 2000. In, in 2000. Uh, I run my own technology company, but uh, prior to that, I have worked for various different technology companies, starting from Ross Perot's, uh, EDS, which then turned into HP, uh, consulting for uh, various different uh, companies, uh, starting with General Motors, that used to be uh, the, the largest shareholder of, of EDS. 
uh, but I've consulted with other companies besides General Motors, uh, such as Baxter Diagnostic, Consumers Power in, in Detroit, uh, Southwestern Bell, which later turned to a at and um, and uh, Hussman lately, Washington University and Renaissance Financial, uh, more on the small to medium-sized businesses. Um, I have also consulted uh, as a management consultant uh, working for PricewaterhouseCoopers and, and IBM. And uh, I was, uh, in those, both those places, I was a, a technology strategy consultant working with uh, C-level executives to develop uh, and implement uh, their technology strategy that aligned with their businesses. I've had my company for about 10 years now, which is Data Dynamics, and uh, we are proud to be a technology agnostic and vendor neutral firm. Thank you. And myself, uh, I am again, Drew Stevens. I have about 35 years of business experience. 25 of those were spent on Wall Street. After all of those experiences in le senior leadership, I decided to open my own firm as a turnaround expert, concentrating a good portion of that on the revenue side. Over the years, I've been a keynote speaker and I've written 14 books on the revenue side in sales, marketing, and I've also um, dabbled a little bit on leadership and management, which is a big part of that. As part and parcel of helping the small to medium-sized businesses that I help, in turnaround uh, dynamics. I also have a second line of business where I help to scale those organizations. And I do that by conducting a debt or private equity raise when necessary, should the organization want to build out, whether it's a merger or an acquisition, or they're looking to just build within the company, maybe they're looking for big dollars for R&D. As I work with senior leaders and as I work with owners, one of the other opportunities that I have is also assisting them on the financial side. I take a good snapshot of their balance sheet of their profit and loss statements. And that has then helped me to look at it from financial advisory and helping them with investments, helping them create more liquidity for the company, creating more liquidity for themselves. And they can actually have a leave a legacy for those within the family or the organization itself. So as we go through this program today, let me tell you why we're looking at this now. What is it that's making us look at this particular topic? Why are we doing this at this particular point in time? And there's a good reason for that. Uh, Saeed, if you wouldn't mind just switching the slide to the next one so our listeners can uh, follow along with me. And here's why Saeed and I are putting this together for you today. What we're finding is that too many businesses are truly close to financial tragedy if they're not. Saeed's going to focus a lot of his presentation on cybersecurity and the dark web. It is an issue today. We have seen multi-millions, if not billions of dollars being lost in private data. We have seen private data get released through the presidential elections. We have seen so, uh, social security and monetary information lost by Target, by Walmart, by Equifax, and many other companies. What we're also finding is that from the other side of the fence, this pandemic is crushing businesses. It's crushing them financially. It's crushing them from a cultural perspective. It's, it's crushing them from a leadership perspective. And what's happening is, is that those fundamental businesses are really lacking the resources necessary to stay afloat in this particular time and even get through it for that matter. What we're also finding is that 97% of most businesses actually place all of their faith in one or two people in the organization. Given this pandemic, that is tragic, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So to cue this up for you, here's what we would like to do. We'd like to start with you understanding how to protect your business from an IT perspective. It was once asked of me when I was working on Wall Street, especially in the days when I was working with Sun Microsystems and DOS eventually became Windows, when microcomputers became client server software, and now that the businesses are in the cloud. What controls or who controls the business? Is it IT or does business control IT? 
as I have gotten friendlier with Saeed over the years, and as we have articulated about the role of IT, here's what we found. Every business out there fundamentally and foundationally needs an information technology department. You can outsource that and you can utilize vendors such as Saeed. You can bring it all in-house and you can manage it yourself. But just like credit card theft back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, just like automobile theft, just like your home, your business is subject to that threat. And what I want to do right now, what we want to do right now, is have Saeed share with you how to protect yourself against cyber warfare, and more importantly, some of the things you don't even know about your own firm that might be found on the dark web. Saeed, go ahead and tell our listeners exactly what they need to do. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Drew. So um, for the next uh, eight to 10 minutes, uh, I will be discussing cybersecurity, uh, also known as IT security. They just use interchangeably. So let me uh, start off by saying that investing in cybersecurity for businesses, whether small, medium, or large, is no longer an option. It is a must. You have to think about cybersecurity and you have to implement best practices. Why? Because there are, at a broad level, uh, three things at risk. One is the data. The second is your operations. And the third is your reputation. Now, they're all given these three bullets. So loss of PII, also known as personally identifiable information. Now, you can have loss of other data that is also pretty bad, but especially if you lose PII, personally identifiable information of employees, clients, vendors, you are looking at identity theft, you're looking at credit downgrade, you're looking at financial liabilities. Any financial liability that your clients incur will be transferred to you with penalties. So loss of personally identifiable information, and when I say personally identify, identifiable information, it just starts with your first name and your last name, your phone number, your address. Those uh, don't look very threatening, but then when personally identifiable information also includes your social security number, your date of birth, and your driver's license, it takes the theft to a very, very dangerous level. The second is your, this, the, the destruction of companies' mission-critical systems that operate your operations directly. What's going to happen if your mission-critical systems, such as your client-facing website, uh, such as your production system, uh, get hit? You're going to be faced with loss of productivity as well as loss of revenues. If you cannot produce, you can't sell. If you can't sell, you cannot generate revenues. And if you're not gonna generate revenues, your profits are gonna disappear, turning into losses, obviously. The third is the destruction of com companies' reputation. So when a loss of personally identifiable information happens or your mission critical system goes down, you experience not just what I just mentioned above, but you also experience loss of customer goodwill. Now, it's, everyone knows how difficult it is to acquire new clients, but once your existing clients lead, leave you for competitors, it is almost next to impossible to bring them back. We've already discussed loss of revenues, and then the other thing is the increased legal expenses. If you're, not, if you're found in non-compliance of your industry, the regulators can impose strict legal fees on you uh, in, in, the form, in the form of penalties, and that could basically uh, doom uh, a disaster for, uh, spell a disaster for your company. So all or any of the above could lead to companies' bankruptcy and, and, and closure. Yeah. So why implement in best practices in cybersecurity? Well, uh, here is one thing that I would like to mention. Uh, actually, two things, I'm sorry. Uh, one is 
that, uh, you know, and, and this is not really talked about cybersecurity experts as much. Cybersecurity experts are focused a lot on loss of revenues and loss of reputation and being found in non-compliance and, and being, you know, involved in, in, in lawsuits that can drain your company's bank account. But here are a couple of other things for you to consider. It is very, investing in cybersecurity is not a guarantee that cybersecurity incidents would not. It would greatly reduce the chances of you having a cybersecurity incident in the first place. So obviously that's, that's, that's there. But if you've invested in cybersecurity and God forbid, if you still have an incident, it is gonna be very difficult for anyone to be to find you negligent really no different than uh, in a surgery um, uh, room where uh, the, the the staff uh, you know practices uh, you know all the sterilization methods and follows the best practices and then a patient after surgery develops infection uh, there the staff will not be found negligent but if the staff was not following the proper procedures and then the the, the patient develops uh, uh, an infection uh you know then it's very likely that they are going to be found negligent they are not going to be able to say well we have performed 99 surgeries without following these procedures and one of them well that's not going to hold in the court right the same thing applies in cybersecurity case as well the other thing that i would like to mention that that uh, a lot of cybersecurity experts miss on is that it has investment in cybersecurity has great implications for you for the valuations of your business. You will no doubt improve the valuation of your business. Two businesses A and B are equal. The buyer looks at business A and business B. Everything else being equal, they're the same. But the only difference between the two is is uh, say uh, one is really buttoned up business in terms of cybersecurity, the other one is not so buttoned up, well, guess what? Who's gonna you know, uh, command a higher multiple? The one that's really buttoned up. So the question in the minds of a lot of uh, businesses, especially, especially small and medium-sized business is that it costs a lot of money. Uh, I don't know if it's going to justify the benefits that I'm going to gain. I don't know, first of all, what the benefits are going to be. Well, the ben benefits are very obvious, but the, even the greater question is, does the cost justify benefits? And the answer is absolutely it does, as long as you spend wisely. I know there are a lot of small and medium-sized businesses that are wary uh, of cybersecurity companies that can charge them you know, uh, a lot of money. Their fees are stratospheric and they get you know, quite a bit turned off by that. It, it doesn't have to be. If you do your proper due diligence uh, and invest in cybersecurity, you can invest in best in implement best practices without breaking your bank. And when you do that, what's gonna, what benefits are you gonna get? You're gonna avoid downtime and productivity losses. You're gonna protect your employees, clients, and suppliers. You're gonna avoid heavy penalties and fines you're gonna avoid losses and bankruptcy. But the three things that I would like to emphasize again, that others either don't emphasize enough or fail to emphasize altogether is as follows. You gain confidence of existing and new, especially large clients. It has great implications for, for revenues. A lot of large clients, large organizations, even, even uh, you know government uh, organizations, are requiring their vendors, their suppliers to invest in cybersecurity, otherwise they will not do business with them. So if you have invested in, in, cyber, in, 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 in best practices of cybersecurity and have a third party assessment done, uh, you will have a much easier time gaining their confidence of your large customers. Then, I've also mentioned to you uh, in, in the previous slide that it sets up as a strong defense in case if you still have an incident, despite having the best practices in place. And then we've also discussed that it increases valuation for your firm. So what I've done is I've highlighted these, I've put them in, in bold, the last three bullets, because that is not emphasized uh, typically in, 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 you know, in other presentations. Uh, briefly, what I would like to now touch upon is the NIST framework. Uh, NIST 
uh, it's a National Institute for Standards and Technology. Um, they have uh, published uh, a framework several years ago and they have improved on that framework. And that framework seems to have become the most popular framework for implementing cybersecurity best practices. Rather than going into a lot of detail, let me just mention that they are based, the whole framework is based on five pillars, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. What do we mean by identify? Well, uh, first you start with identifying the threats that are out there, the cybersecurity risks that you face, okay? Uh, to systems, people, data, everything else that, 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 you can, that you can identify. Then you need to, once you've identified those, then you need to implement mechanisms to protect that data, protect the people, protect the systems, all of that, protect the personally identifiable information. Uh, make sure your your systems uh, you know uh, you know have have uh, built-in protection in them and resiliency. Then, even if you've done everything to protect, things may still happen. So you need to invest in detecting those cybersecurity incidences that may happen, that may slip through the cracks. So you need to have a mechanism to to protect to put a detection mechanism in place. Once you have that, then you need to have a response mechanism in place because despite having best security, some of them are gonna slip uh, through the cracks. You, you're gonna have a detection mechanism in place. Once you detect them, it's possible that by the time you detect it, you may already have some damage in place. So you need to have a response mechanism in place. By response, I mean, how are you gonna deploy your IT, your security team to, to, to mitigate the risk to shut down those systems, but it also means that how you're going to invest in the people and how they're going to respond to your shareholders, your, your communicate with with the media, communicate with the press, uh, communicate with your clients, communicate with your vendors, uh, and even communicate with 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 the uh, with, with your employees. So you need to have a response mechanism in place, and then finally recover. Uh, basically, by that. We, you know, it's it's pretty obvious. Uh, you know, you have responded to, you have detected it, you responded to the incident, and now you need to put mechanism in place, mechanisms in place to to recover from 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 that. So recover your reputation, recover your systems, recover your data, and 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 then continue uh, as as a going concern. So the NIST is is built on five frameworks: identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. You can look at, um, you know, some uh, some uh, uh, organizations choose to not use the NIST framework, and they look at it from a three pillars of information security viewpoint, uh, where you have, you know, three pillars: IT infrastructure, you have operations, and you have policies. Now, I'm not going to go over all the, you know, the, uh, the the details that are listed over here, but uh, uh, you know, uh, suffice it to say is that whatever we identify falls into one uh, or, or more of these pillars. Okay, so for example, firewalls. Let's just, let's just take firewalls. So we wanna make sure that your, you have the best firewall in place. You have uh, a unified threat protection, UTP, in, in place uh, of that. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's an investment that the companies need to make in 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 in, in uh, industrial strength firewalls, and that falls the infrastructure. Uh, you also have operations in place. You need to have policies in place. So now, when you employ a company like ours, we're going to go through this laundry list and make sure that you uh, you know each and every area is adequately addressed. You now this gets even scarier. Uh, back to NIST. Uh, where you have five uh, pillars, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And again, we're not gonna go through all the, you know, the laundry list of items, but you can kind of see over here as to, it gets fairly involved, uh, you know, but whatever, when, when we do an assessment of, of a, a cybersecurity and assessment of the company, uh, we go through all these, uh, you know, all, all these uh, items line by line and make sure that they have a proper identification mechanism in place, protection, detection, response, and recover mechanisms in place. And then we identify where the, the gaps are and what needs to be done to address those gaps. 
the last uh, uh, two things that I would like to mention, uh, I would like to go back to the previous slide one more time. Uh, if you go look at this under policies, you see training and awareness, it's given in, in bold. And I would like to now discuss the training and awareness part. Everyone knows what cybersecurity training is. I don't wanna harp on that. But what I would like to mention is, is uh, the, the training and awareness. There are a couple of areas where people neglect so I'm gonna start with awareness. In, in awareness, uh, not only do you need to uh, increase your employee awareness of, of phishing emails and things like that, but you also, um, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the best practices such as changing password uh, so often and, and all of that, but you um, uh, also need to uh, have a mechanism in place to identify what, what, you know, uh, uh, the, you know the data that is still getting stolen from your company. So people may ask, well, I have a bulletproof cybersecurity in place, so why do I need to monitor the dark web? The simple answer is that you can have a bulletproof security in place, credentials are still going to leak. Credentials, by credentials, I mean username, password, and then along with um, uh, something that gives it more virulence is your personally identifiable information consisting of your date of birth, social security number, driver's license, and other pieces of information. Well, uh, you can have, and, and how does it happen? The way it happens is in this, in, you know, you can have a bulletproof uh, cyber security in place, but your credentials are still going to leak. So how does, how do the credentials leak uh, from you know from a system from from a company where which has implemented bulletproof security uh, The way it leaks is through third parties. So when your employees um, uh, Create accounts and use accounts uh, that are third party on third party systems such as Dropbox such as uber uh, such as uh, maybe um, you know uh, uh, a SaaS product like um, like a CRM that's hosted if those systems get hacked, your email addresses are going to get stolen, along with passwords. And you may have a password change policy in place, but that's still not going to prevent you because when people change passwords, uh, they are going to, first of all, when they create passwords, they're gonna create passwords on, on a third party system, that are gonna be very close to the passwords that they're using on the internal systems. The other thing is if you have a, uh, a, a frequent change password change policy, that sometimes can be counterproductive because when employees are forced to change passwords, they are going to change password by one letter only. And when somebody gets hold of your username and password, it is very easy for them to try different permutations and then break into your system. So you have two options, sit and do nothing, or utilize option two, which is scan the dark web. Once you scan the dark web, you will find what credentials have been stolen, and uh, user in a lot of cases just usernames, but in a lot of but in other cases it's passwords along with and, and in some cases personally identifiable information also. So you can easily change your password, completely change the pattern of your password, and also be ready for some phishing emails because all phishing emails uh, uh, senders need is your email addresses, which are appear in the form of usernames. So continuous monitoring of the web is is should be part of your cybersecurity strategy. And then uh, on the training side, I would like to mention that uh, you can put your employees through training. You can put your employees through lunch and learn. You can keep talking to them about, uh, about phishing emails, uh, but there will always be one or two people in the company, usually not the most technical people who will fall prey to phishing emails. And what better way to train them on phishing emails uh, uh, than to randomly conduct phishing simulations, whereby they will receive uh, phishing uh, uh, emails that are fake phishing emails, and when they click on a link or they respond to a phishing email, such as providing the information that the user is looking for or clicking on a link, rather than something bad happening, happening to them, they'll be forced to watch a video and explaining to them what they, sh what they ended up doing, which they shouldn't have done. So a two minute video and a slight uh, slap on the wrist is all they're gonna get, but then next time they're gonna be more careful and 
uh, as, they, as, as time goes by, they'll become more and more careful and pretty soon they will know how to identify a phishing email when, when they do get hit with a phishing email. So uh, again, uh, two things that we think are necessary for uh, as part of a cyber security, cyber security strategy. One is uh, you know, your uh, dark web monitoring and a fish, email phishing simulations. Both don't cost a whole lot of money at all. Uh, you can hire any company to, to do these two for you. We provide them at a, at a very reasonable charge, uh, but you're free, uh, you know, at least uh, shop around and, and, and find where you can get these two services and, and, and at what cost. Uh, I am uh, uh, Drew, done with my part of the presentation. Uh, back at you. Okay. I'm go okay. ahead and make you a presenter. All righty. Thanks, Sadie. I appreciate it. Um, some really good information and really good information to piggyback off of because we're talking about protecting the business. We're talking about the things that basically employees should be doing, and we're talking about how to make things a whole lot better um, in terms of making things more systematic for employees so that they truly understand what it is that they need to do to move forward um, with their respective businesses, how to make it uh, easier, how to make things more efficient. And so what we want to be able to do now is at least share with you just for a few moments, look, we've looked at some of the hardcore skills as far as um, uh, cybersecurity, some deep stuff. Now what I wanna do is I wanna focus on some of the, call it softer skills, things that we need to do at this particular point um, to help you out in this journey. Um, Saeed, if I can ask you to just take back the presentation, I'll just do a uh, next slide. I would have to, um, I'm not getting the um, ability right now. I would have to restart the computer, so it's just gonna be easier if you uh, hand yep. it. Not a over. problem. Okay, so, um... I'm back to being a presenter. Perfect. So what I want to focus on here are five key principles to help you on that soft skill side, to just help you increase some of the things that, uh, and piggyback off of what Saeed was talking about. As we know, information security is huge. You really need to protect your business. You need to protect really two, your two important assets, and that is your employees as well as your customers. What I want to focus on right here are these five principles in order to protect your business. Leadership, your brand, your finances, your customers, and other areas of security that you didn't even think about, most businesses don't think about, and things that you'll be finding most shocking as I go through this. So let's talk about the, the first couple of areas here. Uh, Saeed, if I could ask you to go to the next slide. And where we are is, let's start on the leadership side and let's give you three areas of concern here. I believe that most businesses, especially when I walk into a turnaround situation, it's related to three vital things. It's related to people, it's related to products, and it's related to processes. <clears throat> where we are today, especially with this pandemic, is that their customer service is getting much more sensitive. We see that businesses are failing simply because they're saying that there's not enough money in the bank, they need stimulus money to activate. Yet there are some businesses, when we read in the paper, are doing quite well. And you have to scratch your head and recognize that, yes, I get it. Some places are closed, like gyms and restaurants, hoteliers. But on the other hand, some others are still doing very well and they still exist in that industry. Where I'm saying our areas of concern are these three things. Number one, people. I have a PhD, and I didn't talk to you about that in the biography, and I don't talk about it a lot, but I've done a tremendous amount of research in this area. I've done it academically, and I've used it for well over 25 years on the corporate side. And what I have found is very congruent with Jim Collins's book back in the early millennium and that is good to great but what jim collins talks about is having the right people on the bus and if you're hiring people just to have some sort of description that you have to adhere to 
If you're hiring people simply because they're great people and they need to just fit into the culture, I have to tell you, that's bogus. The fact is, is that you have to hire people for their innate skills. If you're not hiring for the innate skills and you're not helping to build to the culture, then all you're doing is damaging your organization. It all starts with having the white people in the white seat. People do make a difference. The second thing that you need to do to protect your business, stop building products and services just because you think that they're cool. And I have to say that again, and it, you're, some of you are going to get very defensive, but you need to understand this is that you're in the marketing business. And when you're in the marketing business, and it doesn't matter if you're trying to invent the next best cola or if you're the next best bed and breakfast, the fact is, is that people have wants and needs. Those consumers that have wants and needs sometimes don't know necessarily know what that is, but your particular product has got to have value. And it's got to be creating enough value that has some differentiation from the competition. And if you can't determine how that product itself retrofits into what that differentiation is, you're winding up ruining your business. And here are some examples of that. Chiropractors, boutique, bodegas, <clears throat> restaurants, bars, and the list goes on. Why do I say that? Because there's a common denominator with every product or service I've mentioned. Most set up in a strip mall. Most put their name on a kiosk. And most then just sit there and pray and think that their product is the best thing since sliced bread. And what winds up happening is they get very few people coming in because there's nothing for that product or service to differentiate them from the competition. And last but not least, the processes. Processes are huge. What I mean by processes are two things that you need to have to protect your your business, cover your, or as they say, CYA, cover your assets. And where I'm at with this is number one, from a process procedure, start walking around. I have a CEO right now who has a very large scale organization, 200 people within the organization. I, I have asked to speak to him on numerous occasions and the chief operating officer answers me, answers me the exact same way. I'm sorry, Brian's very busy. The next time he can talk to you is six weeks from now. Folks, I got to tell you, that's bull. If the CEO is too busy to walk around and interface with his own employees, then he doesn't deserve to be CEO. He's having the business run him rather than him running the business. That's issue number one. Issue number two from a process perspective it then relates to customer service. You've got to journey map what happens with your organization. You need to know what your touch points are within the organization. And that's crucial for success because we're not mystery shopping. And if you don't know how customers come in and how customers stay, then you don't know what's happening in your own business. You're not in the business to make money. You're in the business for the acquisition and retention of clients. And the sooner you get involved in that, the better off your business processes are going to be. Why? Because you're going to get rid of the minutia and create a streamlined interface from customer to customer. Next slide, if you would, Saeed, please. Sure. <clears throat> In addition to that, what I find on the first tip here is that too many organizations are too tactical. What do I mean by tactical? Well, as I talk to leaders about their business and what's happening in their business, the reason why it's failing and where you'll know that the, the business is failing is A, when you're needing to fire people because they're quote unquote not. Right. So tip number two, and what I wanna suggest on tip number two here really correlates to marketing and it's the reason why many businesses seem to fail. Number one, they don't know the personas that they're attracting. And number two, they're not creating enough marketing attraction. There's a business that I'm currently working with has roughly around eight, 900 individuals at it. And all I continually hear when I meet with the CEO is bang the phones, bang the phones, slime, uh, dial and smile, dial and smile. That is not the way that you grow business. First of all, cold calling is dead. And I'm going to say that again for people that 
didn't get it the first time. Cold calling is dead. It's obtrusive, it's interruptive, it's disgusting. And with everybody carrying a cell phone today, caller ID is coming up. And if the caller's number is not recognized, you're going to get hung up on. If you really want to tr really and truly create better opportunities for your business, for yourself, and a better brand, you need to create community. You need to create what's known as marketing gravity. How to get people attracted to you. You do that by articulating value. You do that by creating a tremendous community. And you do that by creating an array of opportunities for individuals to find out about you. I have a tremendous number of ways, roughly 25, 26 different ways. And if you're interested, I can share with you a very quick tip sheet in order to show you how to build that attraction that's necessary so that you can truly secure your business. Before I get to tip three, I'll leave you with one vital point here, and that is simply this. If you really think you're in the business that you're in, I don't care if you're an accountant or an attorney, I don't care if you're selling hot dogs or pizza, at the end of the day, you're in the marketing business. Unfortunately, too many individuals, consumers, stereotype us. And if you're continually getting stereotyped, then you're not creating differentiation. You don't create differentiation, you don't create value. You don't create value, you don't create a community. And that's where, in this tip, you're not protecting your business for long-term gain. Saeed, tip number three, please. You know, when it comes to protecting the business, there's a couple of different things here. Number one, financially, life is gonna throw you curveballs. Every single business suffers from some level of seasonality. Every single business suffers from an array of expenses. And there are KPIs that you need to focus on in order to secure your business. First and foremost, if you're a small business and if you don't think that you need budgets to understand where your business is at or how much money you should be spending on the business, go back and visit with an accountant, a tax uh, planner, or some of the financial expert to help you with your business. You truly need to have budgets so that you're not overspending. I was with a business the other day that's approximately four or five million dollars in top line revenue. Believe it or not, 68% of the company's expense was employee expense. I once took over a job as the CEO of a public relations firm. As I looked at the books and was walking away from that opportunity, I found out that the business expense of 82% was for employees. That's horrific. You as a business owner, you as a senior leader need to establish key performance indicators for the organization. You need to understand what your profit margin is. You need to understand what your EBITDA is. You need to understand what your cost of goods is. I once worked with a $20 million company, came up with a price for educational software, and I said to him, what is your cost? You have this MSRP, but I need to understand what the cost is for this particular product. And you know what he said to me? I don't know. I have no clue what you're suggesting here. And that's horrific. That's horrific because if you don't know what your cost of goods is, then you're going to be sunk each and every time. It's crucial to your success in order for you to run the business effectively, to have these key business indicators in line so that you're not overspending and you keep your top line revenue growing. And a couple of other important points. Number one, if you're a small business, you need to pay your local vendors first. The last thing that you want is the local vendor saying that there's a deadbeat in the neighborhood because you're not paying your suppliers and vendors efficiently. Secondly, always look to be paying your employees. I can't tell you how many times I'm with organizations that sit there and they scratch their head and say, I don't have enough money for payroll. That's your problem. That's not the employee's problem, nor should they have to wait to get paid. You, if you want to keep your reputation and you wanna make sure that you're not the deadbeat in the business, then you better make sure you pay your vendors and your employees. And last but not least, you need to determine how to pay yourself. 
There are so many that are working so hard, 50, 60, 100 and some odd hours a week. Let's face it, when you're a small, even if you're a medium-sized owner uh, for a business, and when I say medium-sized, we're talking double-digit millions. We're talking 10, 20, 50 million dollars. Even if you're the senior officer, you can't allow the business to run you. You need to run the business. And if you're not paying yourself in that business, then you're not securing the business and the business is doomed to failure. Tip number four. When we look at tip number four here, what we're looking at is customer service. And what I want you to understand is simply this, and it comes from a famous quote back in 1954 from a book called The Practice of Management. That book written by the famous management guru, Peter Drucker, who said the purpose of business is the customer. The reason why you're in business is the acquisition and retention of customers. And I mentioned this earlier. You need to journey out what that map looks like. You need to walk the cycle. You need to mystery shop the organization. I once had a large, very large, hundreds of millions of dollars in an organization once say to me that logistically things were getting broken. And I truly mean logistics. And he kept blaming all of the carriers for these particular products that he had, that it was the postal service, it was an express mail service, and what he did not recognize until I told him repeatedly to walk the business, it was his own shipping and receiving department that was destroying the package. If you don't know what's happening in your own department, how do you expect then to have these wonderful customers returning to you? The second thing is, is that if you really want to have a good experience, then you really truly need to walk the walk. I love all of these telecommunications firms that put these uh, interactive voice systems together. You know what I'm talking about. Hit one to speak English. Hit two if you're having a technical problem. And remember, our menu items have changed. So please listen to this message completely. Oh, come on. We all know that the menu items haven't changed. And the fact is, is that I'm getting irritated listening to you. I want to talk to a real person. The UX today, the user experience is based upon interaction and it's based upon personalization. And you need to understand what the theology is. I'm putting together another webinar, it literally as I'm speaking to you about how customer service is altered during this pandemic. And what we have found out with all of the research that we're conducting is simply this. Number one, yeah, Customers have gotten very demanding, but because they've gotten so demanding, we need to create easier pathways for them to get the answers to information that they're looking for. And by not walking the business, you're actually ruining the capability of customers telling other customers. Believe it or not, when you have a great reputation, believe it or not, when customers are happy with conducting business with you, they're going to come back over and over and over again, and more importantly, because of what I spoke to you on tip number three about finances, if you have happy customers, happy customers lower your financial expense for customer acquisition by over 68%. That's money you can put in the bank. <clears throat> number five, <clears throat> when we look at tip number five here, what I want you to be thinking is simply this. I want you to understand that people make a difference. You need to learn how to protect key people in the organization. And if you are the owner of the organization, you need to protect yourself. What we've learned about COVID is simply this. Many firms, and when I say many, over 94% of organizations, perhaps your organization, relies upon two people in the organization to produce all of the business, to be responsible for all of the administration. I don't want to scare you, but I want to protect you. And what you need to understand is simply this, and I'll frame it in a question. What happens when the key person becomes disabled? Should they get COVID and are down for the count for two, three, four weeks? What happens if you, the business owner, becomes disabled? And let's face it, what we know about organizations is simply this, and I wanna do it this way. We know that people die, 
we know that people get fired and we know that people quit. In this pandemic, what we truly know is people get sick. What we know is that we caught this pandemic at the end of the flu season. We also know that part of this pandemic and many of the deaths that were attributed to it were from people that had pre-existing diseases, whatever those diseases are. That research is still out for the count. So therefore, what happens if, heaven forbid, any of you get impacted by this particular disease? What happens if you get involved in an auto accident? What happens because many of us are under quarantine have decided to do do-it-yourself projects and now can't work and you become disabled? You need to figure out what kind of insurance you can obtain in order to protect those key people. And there is something known as key person insurance. What happens if you, the business, business owner, becomes disabled or, heaven forbid, perish from this god-awful disease or anything else? There happens to be something known as business owner's expense. What it does is it pays the employee's salary. It pays all of the business expenses. Doesn't pay the business owner, but it pays everybody else. And it's a great way to alleviate many of the liabilities of running your own business should you become disabled, should you unfortunately perish. You need to think about what you need. And last but not least, what about exit income? Did you ever think of what, what's going to happen when you walk away from the business? Did you ever think if you're a senior leader, what happens if you decide to retire? If you have these questions in your head, my suggestion is to give me a call, email me, and I'll be more than happy to walk you through that process. But it's these things that you truly need to understand because these are the ways in which you truly will help to protect your business. As I finish up here, and before Saeed and I provide some ways in which that you can get a hold of us, let me just go through one very quick item, and that's some best practices to help you to secure your business. You've heard a lot from the two of us today. <clears throat> and so what I want to share with you is simply this. Number one, you need to protect your business. You need to protect your business as a good business practice by putting in place good cybersecurity methods, good methods that will secure your data, secure your infrastructure, and most importantly, secure your people. Number two, what you need to do is you need to learn how to protect your people. You do that with good leadership. You do that with terrific communication and unbelievable strategy. And the other thing that you want to be able to protect are the key people within your organization as well as yourself. And last but not least, when you're looking at best practices, what you also want to be thinking about is how to protect your personal assets how to give yourself that liquidity, how to make sure that you have longevity for business moving forward. And last but not least, having the legacy that you wanna create for your family, for your friends, your colleagues, for life everlasting. I wanna thank you for listening to this webinar today. And before you go, before you end, Saeed and I would like to give you some ways to become in contact with us. Saeed? So, uh, Drew, thank you very much. Um, great presentation. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed it. Uh, as far as uh, getting in touch with me, you can uh, email me at saeed.akbani at datadynamics-inc.com. You can reach me on my phone at 314-368-5064. And uh, if you would like to know more about uh, what we do at Data Dynamics and how we might be of help to you uh, and uh, to other companies that you may know, uh, just visit our website at datadynamics-inc.com uh, where you'll find a tremendous amount of information uh, and you'll also find ways to, to be able to get in touch with us, um, you know, send us inquiries and find out more about our services. Over to you. Back over to you, Drew.
Thank you, sir. And for those of you that are looking to get a hold of me or perhaps any of the books or services that I have, please don't uh, hesitate to give me a call at 314-574-9716. Or you can visit my website, which is drew-stevens with a V dot com. Or last but not least, you can always email me, which is drew, D-R-E-W at drew-stevens.com. It has been an incredible pleasure to deliver this particular information for you all this afternoon on how to protect and secure your business. We believe we've given you some great tools, great resources, if nothing else to think about. You may not feel that you need this information right now, but what we wanted to do is give you some knowledge. Knowledge that's not only going to help you now, but knowledge that will help you in the future. And more importantly, because we're business owners, we believe that protecting the business is the best thing that you can do for your future, for the legacy of your firm, for the legacy of your family, and for the legacy of your employees, as well as your customers. Thank you very much for listening. God bless, and we hope to be able to bring you more information like this in the future.